Well, good evening, everybody. So good to see you. Hope you've had a good day and uh, glad to see you here this evening. If you want to go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to Psalms chapter 1, as we're going to begin tonight, uh, where we're going to be tonight. And as you're turning there, I want to share with you from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, just remind you what Jesus Christ has done for us and how uh, we should be mindful of this constantly and just uh, give him praise and worship and thanks for it. But Ephesians 2, 1 says this, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. I don't know about you, but I am so thankful Jesus has made me alive when I was dead in my trespasses, when I was dead in my sins. And, and that's the change Jesus has brought to our life. And sometimes the sad reality is we kind of get accustomed to that. We, we forget what Jesus has done for us. You know, in another uh, epistle, Paul talks about moving us from the, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of, of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of light. You know, you think about when that happened, what Jesus has done for us, you know, eternally, but also every day of our lives, that we are no longer in bondage to sin, we no longer are dead, we're alive now. And I'm just thankful for what Jesus has done in our life, and we should constantly be mindful of that, and just uh, let that be reflected in our time of praise throughout the day, in our time of worship, and just give him thanks. So let's begin by thanking him for that. Father, we are grateful for your love for us, we are grateful for your perfect plan of salvation through your son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, thank you that you have taken us who were once dead. We were dead in our sins. We were dead in our trespasses. And you have made us alive. We placed our faith in you to trust you as our Lord and Savior. We give you thanks and we give you praise. Father, we thank you for the change you have brought to our lives here and now, but also for all eternity. And how every day that impacts our lives. May we be mindful of that every day. And may we just live a life of praise and thanksgiving and worship to you because of what you've done to change us, Father. And we just thank you for making us alive. We give you praise. Bless this time we have tonight as we dive into Psalms chapter 1. And we ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, tonight we're beginning a series to the book of Psalms. Now, don't worry, I'm not preaching through the whole book. There's a, you know, 150 chapters. You think how long I've been in Corinthians. You know, I told you Sunday I've been in Corinthians. 28 messages and we're only through chapter 9. I think if we preach the book of Psalms, we'd be there until Jesus comes, you know. And stuff. But, but we're just going to hit some, some Psalms throughout this study. You know, uh, over the next several weeks, we're not hitting all of them. And tonight we're beginning with Psalms chapter 1. And it's not really because it's the first Psalm, but we're beginning because a lot of Bible scholars believe it's so key to understanding the rest of the book of Psalms. When we truly understand what Psalms chapter 1 is all about. But I want you to notice, what's the very first word in Psalms chapter 1? Blessed, isn't it? Think about that word blessed. You know, it's important that we understand what that word means. This word blessed is used multiple times throughout the book of Psalms. Well, that word blessed is a pronouncement of joy. It's a pronouncement of, of satisfaction, of excitement, of fulfillment, of, of peace, all from God. This is what God wants to bestow upon us. This is what God wants to give us. And when you think about when he does give us joy, when he does give us satisfaction and, and peace and excitement and fulfillment, we truly are blessed. That's the definition of blessed. And it can literally be translated happy. You know, the entire book of Psalms begins with God pronouncing this blessing on us, God pronouncing happiness upon us, blessing upon the person that lives their life a certain way. This is not just a general blessing. There's, there's qualifications to being blessed, that we have to live the way God calls us to live. And that's what Psalms chapter 1 is all about. Now, contrary to what people think, God is not some cosmic killjoy. You ever heard people talk like that? That God just wants to take away all the fun in life. You know, he's some cosmic killjoy. And, and people say, God doesn't want us to be blessed. God doesn't want us to be happy. Guess what God desires for us? He desires for us to be blessed this way. God wants you to be happy. He desires that. So much so that in the very first paragraph of the, of the longest book in the Bible, here in the book of Psalms, he prescribes a way for us to experience this, to be complete completely blessed and happy in him. And, and really what we're looking at tonight is, is the idea of how to be happy. Now, I'm going to define that a little bit different than the way the world here in just a minute, but, but I want you to know that's where we're headed, is how to be happy according to what God says, what God's definition is. Or another way to say that is how to be blessed. You know, uh, there was a preacher back in the 18th century by the name of Jonathan Edwards, and, and he once wrote this. He said, God created man for nothing else but happiness. He created him only that he might communicate happiness to him. Now, some people might look at that or listen to that and say, you know, I'm not sure if I believe that or not. And, and they may not believe it because their version of happiness doesn't match God's version of happiness. When God speaks of happiness, he's not talking about fun. He's not talking about feelings. He's not talking about having great fortune. 
You know, he's not talking about happiness that is based upon circumstances or happiness that is based upon physical comfort or based upon, you know, some six-figure salary or something like that or being absence of conflict, of having conflict in your life or, or having the approval of people. He's not talking about that sort of happiness. You know, now, those things may not be inherently bad by themselves, some of them. And actually, God might allow us to experience some of those things as, as his blessing upon our life. But we, 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 we err greatly when we begin to think that those things are essential components to being blessed. We err when we think those things are, are so vital to being happy in our life. When we want to experience deep abiding happiness, we look at how the world defines happiness instead of how God defines happiness. Because if you can have all those things in life, the reality is you can still be so unhappy. I mean, you think about people out there that are multimillionaires. And there are some miserable people that are multimillionaires, you know. I don't know anybody personally like that, but, but you know, I mean, they, you just, they do interviews. And they, they're always wanting more. They're so greedy. They're so unhappy. They're so mean. And that doesn't make you happy. What makes you happy is your relationship with Christ. God says that he offers us this, this limitless happiness, if you will, you know, that doesn't require you any of those things in our life. Because it's not based on those things. It's based on who God is. And in Psalms chapter 1, God's prescription of maintaining this blessedness or having this holy happiness, if you want to call it that, you know, helps us to live in this difficult world. He wants us to have this. God wants you to be in pursuit of this. God wants you to be in possession of this in your life. But he wants us to do it the right, in the right kind of way. You know, so if we're going to, you know, have this, Psalms chapter 1 tells us how to be happy. It shares, it shares with us three ways to do that. First off, number one, we need to reject the influence of the world. If we're going to truly be happy by God's definition of happiness or blessedness, we need to reject the influence of the world. Look at verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. You know, isn't it interesting that the very first thing that God says about truly being happy is not what you do, but what you don't do. You know, if you're going to be happy, you have to know what you're going to stand for, but also what you're going to stand against. And saying yes to the impact of God in your life requires, first off, to say no to some influences. The influence of the world. And the world has great influence upon our life if we let it. How does a person go about doing that? How does a person say no to the influence of the world? Well, he kind of shares with us three things here. He basically says, look, don't listen to the skeptical. Look again, blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now think about what counsel is. Counsel is aimed, uh, you know, to, to help us. Excuse me, counsel is purpose is to help us make decisions in life. You know, and we need to be aware of who we listen to because their counsel can affect us. The people that we listen to can affect us. It can affect our happiness. You know, you can't listen to the world and follow the advice of the world or follow the counsel of the world and still live for the Lord Jesus Christ. It just doesn't go hand in hand. The world says, just think about yourself. You take care about yourself. But what does the Bible tell us? What does Paul tell us? Paul said he died to himself daily. That's not the way of the world, is it? The world says, look, you know, if, if you fuss enough, you, you know, the old saying, the squeaky wheel gets, gets the grease, right? You know? But what does God's word tell us? Don't complain about anything, but pray about everything. You know? Totally contrary to the advice of the world, God's word is. You know, the psalmist says, the person full of heaven's happiness or blessedness adamantly refuses to listen to the counsel or listen to the advice of certain people out there in the world. And he describes those people. He says they're the ungodly. Now, the ungodly isn't just referring to people who are obviously blatantly against God. You know, they're not, you know it's not just the people that are anti-God. There's plenty of people out there that are like that. But ungodly, you know, it's not just people that go around saying, you know, I work for the devil or anything like that wearing a T-shirt, you know, that says that. But there's a lot of people that believe in God, but they live ungodly lives. There's a lot of people that they're nice people, but they're not godly people. There's a lot of people that believe in God, but they don't know God. They don't love God. They don't serve him. And, and they don't care to live for him. That's most of the world. And that's the definition of ungodly. Why would we ever want to go to them to get counsel of how to live our life when the word of God tells us how to live our life? God says the person who possesses and maintains happiness in their life, you know, listens and accepts God's wisdom. Doesn't live by the world's wisdom. So you intentionally reject the influence of the world by not listening to those type of people. Another way to reject the influence of the world is don't imitate the sinners. Look what he says. He says, nor stands in the path of sinners. That word sin there is exactly what you think it is. It's the idea of missing the mark. Sinners are those people that continually miss the mark of God. They choose to live this way. They don't care. That's just how they choose to live. That's what he's talking about here. They stay in their sin. They're, they're comfortable in their sin. They're happy in their sin. They're not comfortable. They're satisfied where they are. 
And God says, look, holy, happy people don't live that way. They don't persistently practice sin. And that's the people he's talking about here. Now, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that we have no association with sinners. That's not what I'm saying. We have to be among people that don't know Jesus Christ, you know? We have to be among them, but we don't participate in what they're doing. You know, we live in a world, we, live, we work around people that don't know Jesus, people that they would fall in this category of sinners here, you know? But we don't live like them. There's a difference, isn't there? We'll never reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ if we look no different than the people that don't know Jesus the Lord and Savior. If we behave and live like lost people. If we compromise our beliefs. You see, we're to be in the world, but the world is not to be in us. Happy people don't imitate the world. Another way to reject the influence of the world is don't join the scoffers, what he says here. Look at what he says, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. The English Standard Version translates scornful as scoffers there. You know, they not only practice sin, but they parade it out there. They mock us. They, they laugh about their sin. They mock God. They, they parade their sin in front of everybody to see. They mock Christianity. They mock the church. They ridicule Christians, and they, and they mock the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, a scoffer considers nothing sacred, and he has no fear of divine judgment. He's not worried about any consequences of his actions. Notice the progression here in verse 1. We start with walking, and then standing, and then sitting. Did you notice that? It's a downward spiral here is what the psalmist is getting at. It goes from thinking to behaving to belonging. You see, worldly advice leads to worldly action, which leads to worldly affection. Happy is a person who recognizes that danger and says, that's not for me. I'm not going to be influenced by the world. So here's what we need to think about in our own lives. Are we allowing things that we watch? Are we allowing things that we read? Are we allowing things that we listen to? Are we allowing worldly people that we may look up to? Are we allowing them to influence our life in such a way that it doesn't line up with the Word of God? That it doesn't line up with the way of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we saying yes to some things that we need to be saying no to? But simply saying no to the ways of this world is not the full equation here. It's only half of it, how to be happy. There's a second way he gives us here. Number two of how to be happy, love the guidance of the Lord. We need to love the guidance of the Lord. Look what he says in verse two. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law, he meditates day and night. You know, detesting the ways of the world is part of the path to true happiness there. But it will not get you all the way there. God says we must also delight in the law of the Lord. And that word law means there the full revelation of God's word. We're talking about the word of God here. That word delight literally means to take great pleasure in. Think about some things that you really love in life, that you really take great pleasure in. That's how we're to view God's word. That when we go to God's word, we take great pleasure in to, to open it up and to dive into it and to get into it. When we're close to God or we're right with God, we find such joy, we find such pleasure, we find such satisfaction in the word of God. Why? Because it's in there that you get to know God. It's in there that you, that you feel God's presence, that you understand God's plan, you sense God's power. God's word gives us godly thoughts. Those godly thoughts become our godly attitudes. Those godly attitudes lead us to godly living. And when you're living that way, God's pleased with our lives. Psalms 37 verse 4 says this, Delight yourselves also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. What you delight yourself in will inevitably shape what you desire in life and what you will be you know when you delight yourself in the world it will change your desires to delight more into the world and you become more like the world when you delight yourself in God's word it's going to change your desires to become more like Jesus and you'll find satisfaction in the word of God you'll find satisfaction becoming more Christ-like the psalmist says the person that is full of God's happiness is a person that is full of God's word they will love the guidance they will love instruction from the Lord. And that begins with reading our Bible, but it doesn't end there. You know, the sad reality is many Christians, the ones that do read their Bible, they might do a one-minute devotional, or they might look at their phone and like, you know, mine it doesn't do it anymore, but it used to give me a verse of the day. You know, I don't know why it stopped. You know, probably an update I got or something. I don't know. But they think that's enough. I did my one-minute devotion. I got my verse of the day. And then we don't give it another thought for the rest of the day. And so think about that. We spend two minutes looking at God's word, but we spend 23 hours and 58 minutes being influenced by the world. 
That's like treating the Bible like a good luck charm rather than treasure it for something that's more precious, more valuable than gold and gems and silver. Notice the psalm, psalmist doesn't say, if you want to be happy, read your Bible every day. He doesn't say that, does he? What does he say? He says, if you want to be happy, meditate on God's word day and night. That pretty much covers it, doesn't it? So constantly be rolling God's word over your mind. Meditate. So, so one, one pastor put it this way. Meditate is the underlying meaning. It means this, humming. Have you ever been humming something you don't even realize? And he, and he said this. It was kind of, it's kind of the background noise of your brain. It's playing so often you don't, have a time, you don't have a time that it's not. That's the picture that the psalmist is getting at here. It's just constantly going kind of in the background of, of, of what you're doing throughout the day. We're so consumed, we're so saturated by God's word, we're reading it, we're studying it, we're thinking about it, we're memorizing it, we're applying it to our lives. That it's just constantly like playing this background music in the, in the back of our mind. And it's, just, it's like air breathing in your lungs, it just comes natural. We're just constantly thinking these thoughts. More and more in every situation of your life, God's word will, will flow out of you because God's word is what's in you when you meditate on the word of God. God promises when you love and you delight yourself in his guidance and his instruction and his word, you apply it to, to the way that you live, you apply it to the way that you think, you're truly going to be blessed. You're going to be happy as a child of God. Could it, excuse me, could it be that so few of us are really happy because we don't take God's word that seriously? Now, please hear me on this. I'm not talking about duty. I'm not talking about legalism here. I'm talking about delight. That we long to dive into God's word. Not just get our gold star for the day that I read. I read my three chapters. What did you read about? I don't know, but I read my three chapters. What good does that do? You know? And, and you know, if we harass somebody into reading God's word, you can't ever force someone into loving and delighting in God's word. We need to dive into it ourselves and build that love and build that delight in God's word. Happy people delight in and rejoice over God's word. They read it, they study it, they memorize it, they focus on it, they think about it, they apply it to their lives. And I want to challenge you and I want to challenge myself as well. Let's ask God to give us a greater appetite for God's word. To give us a greater appreciation for his word. So that we make it a priority in our life. That we find time for it. Ask God to help you recognize and minimize those time filters. You know, we all have time filters. You ever had somebody say this? You know, I don't have time to do anything. We find time to do the things we want to do. That's what it comes down to. Isn't it true? We may be super busy, but we still find time to do the things that we want to do. You know? We need to ask God, God, show me those time fillers. And maybe we can remove some of those time fillers so we have more time for God's work. I mean, remember the old country song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places? Anybody remember that? Don't act like you don't. Some people, thank you. Some people admitted it. So I'm going to say, don't act like y'all haven't heard that. So... You know, many of us are looking for happiness in all the wrong places. And it shouldn't surprise us when we don't find it. If you truly want to be happy, you want to be blessed, you find it in God's word. What do you allow to affect you more? The influence of the world or the guidance of the Lord? And there's one more part of this promise uh, uh, that God tells us how to be happy. The final way of how to be happy is number three, experience the impact of the word. We need to experience the impact of the world. Of the word, not the world, the word. It's not just what we do with the word, but what the word does to us, that it brings a change into our life, that we let it affect us, we let it change us, we let, us, let it to, to mold us and shape us and, and to chisel us if need be, remove things from our life to be more Christ-like. And then we experience joy and fulfillment and satisfaction. The psalmist says, when you reject the world and love the word, word of God, that you will be planted. Notice what he says there in verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You're rooted. You're secure. You're growing. Notice it doesn't say that he shall be like a stump of a tree. What's a stump of a tree? It showed once where life was, right? You know? It doesn't say you'll be like a twig laying on the ground. A twig is lifeless. There's no life being fed into it anymore. No, the psalmist is talking about something that's planted, that's flourishing, that's alive. How do you know if, you're, if a tree has good roots? Well, look at the storm coming through, this hurricane or tropical storm that it is now coming through. It's going to knock down some trees, but some trees that have really good roots, they're still going to be standing when that storm comes through. You know? And the same is true of our life. You want to know if you're, you're really rooted in the Word of God when the storms of life hit? Are you still standing? 
Or do you get knocked over, you know? Are we guided by the principles of God's word? Are we firmly planted in God's word so we can stand the trials of life? Now contrast that with the world that rejects and refuses God's word in verse 4. Look what he says. The ungodly are not so. So in other words, they're not going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. But they're like the chaff which the wind drives away. Now chaff in the wind, think about it. There's no stability. There's no security. There's no foundation. It has no life. It is waste is what it is. It's dead. God says if you build your life in the wisdom of mankind, if you build your life in the influence of the world, there's no chance of you having any lasting substance in this life or the next. Ultimately, your life and your accomplishments in this life will dry up and they'll blow away like dust in the wind. Like chaff in the wind is what he's saying there. The psalmist also says that when we reject the world and we love the word of God, we're going to be protected. Now, not from pain, not from difficulty. I'm not preaching prosperity gospel that you'll never have hardship. You'll never have difficulty. Your kids will always be nice to you and say nice things to you. That's not what we're talking about here. The thing about a tree, every tree goes through tough times, doesn't it? Some make it, some don't. Look again what he says in verse 3. Whose leaf also shall not wither. Dry leaves reveal something about that tree. Those roots, and I'm not talking about in the fall when they drop. I'm just talking about in a drought. Those roots have become dry. If a drought comes in the middle of summer and the leaves on on most of the trees are going to wither, they're going to die, they're going to fall off, aren't they? But if a tree is planted by the streams of water, those roots are going to find nourishment and water it needs from that stream. And its leaves are not going to wither during that drought when all the other trees are dropping its leaves. You see, your life doesn't depend on your outward circumstances. It doesn't depend on your situations that that everyone else can see. Sometimes what's working beneath the surface is, is what really matters. Even when life's drought hits you, when, when, when you know, everybody's in drought, you can still be nourished by God. You can be protected because you're planted in the unchanging water source of God's word. Think about that. Through times of drought in your life, God can sustain you through it. He can strengthen you through it. He can nourish you through it. He can grow you through it. Some of the most growth that we take place, that would take place in our life is when we're in the valley, not up on the mountaintop. Because we depend on God more in the valley. And we see God in a different way than we ever do up on the mountaintop when we're in the valley. You see, when you delight in God's word, you're going to stay standing when others are going to be wilting. Contrast that with verse 5. He says, therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment or sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The ultimate focus of this psalm is not just talking about this life only. It's talking about eternity as well. You can only accurately measure success and failure in the light of eternity. You can't base it on this life alone. See, God will protect. God will preserve. God will take care of those that love him, those that listen to him, those that live for him. But those that reject him, those that don't love him, those that live apart from God, they ignore the truth of God's word. Nothing in this life can protect you for what's to come. When judgment day comes, they're not going to be protected. They're not going to be spared from the wrath of God. They'll not be able to stand in God's presence. They're not going to be able to stand with the presence of God's people either. The psalmist also says when you reject the world and you love the word of God, you become prosperous. Look again at verse 3. He says there, that brings forth its fruit and its seeds. And then later on he says, and whatever he does shall prosper. Now again, I'm not talking prosperity gospel here. I'm not talking about promises of health and promises of wealth. If you just listen and obey God, you know, that you never have hardships. We know that's not reality. And those nut jobs on YouTube or TV that tell us are just that. They're nut jobs because they're lying. But the sad thing is so many people believe them. Now they're making the millions of dollars. But the people that are watching them are, are not living that way. You know? But what the psalmist is saying that when your spiritual roots are deep, when you have spiritual fruit is it, it growing, it's going to be prosperous in your life. Notice the difference between a man of God and a man of this world. A man of God is going to be prosperous. Or a woman of God is going to be prosperous. But a man of the world, a woman of the world is going to perish. Look at verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You see what this psalms is? It's a contrast of two types of people. The righteous and the ungodly. Or the saved and the unsaved. Two paths that you can go. The way of the word of God or the way of the world. And there's two results. An eternity that's prosperous. 
or eternity where you perish. That's truly happiness when you have an eternity that prospers, is prosperous. Because you're going to be with God forever. Let me make this clear. We can't earn God's righteousness. You can't earn it by studying the word of God. Jesus said to the Pharisees, they knew the scripture, remember? They missed out on the Savior. They knew God's word. But they missed out on the Messiah. They memorized it, but they missed out on the meaning of what the scripture said. So this knowing the scriptures is not going to do it. You've got to receive the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Knowing that he died for you. He paid the penalty for your sins. He rose again the third day. And when you ask him to come into your life, he will save you. You receive his righteousness. And that changes you. But now we're called to live in such a way that God is glorified. We don't continue living like we did before. We live different. And that's part of the contrast here of Psalms chapter 1. But not every Christian lives that way. Charles Spurgeon once said this. He said that the half-committed Christian is the most miserable person on earth. He's just enough in the world to be miserable in the presence of God. He's just enough into God to be miserable in this world. Isn't that so true? You can't ride the fence. When you do, you're miserable. You are. But God wants us to be blessed. God wants us to be happy. And he has shown us how to do it. The question is, are we truly happy the way that God defines it? Are we truly blessed the way that God defines it? If not, what needs to change in our life? Father, we thank you for how much you love us, how much you care for us, and what you desire for our lives. You do desire for us to be blessed. You do desire for us to be happy by your standard and definition of happiness, not the, what we think or the way of the world. And Father, you show us how to live that way. And this is just a brief part of that tonight, what we've seen. But Father, may we truly evaluate our lives to see what our happiness is based on. Is it based on you and our relationship with you and your word, or is it based on the world and following the world and the circumstances? Because that's fickle. Our happiness will come and go. But Father, when it's based on you, it doesn't fade. And we thank you for that. And Father, we're not just talking about living a a life to be happy. We're talking about living a life that brings honor and glory to you. Because you are worthy for us to live this way. You are worthy of all the glory and honor that we can just bestow upon you. Going back to how we began in Ephesians 2. That you have taken us who were once dead and you have made us alive. We're no longer dead in our sin. We're now alive because of Jesus Christ. Help for our lives to reflect that. And us to live in such a way that you are honored and glorified. And our lives are an act of worship to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.